All right, today we're actually getting into what Gauss's law. So, um, this is the AP objective: take the law in integral form and apply it qualitatively to relate flux, flux, and electric charge for specified surfaces. So, um, there are two things that go into Gauss's law. The first thing, what we're going to talk about, is flux. That's a electric flux. It's any field, but for us particularly, it's the electric field. Um, times the area that it's passing through. That's very important. And the next thing uh, is how flux relates to enclosed charge. So, um, basic idea is this. Let's pretend I have a charge right here. And emanating from that charge in all directions is the electric field. And if I enclose that in a surface, and, and you'll see a much better picture of this later, but if I enclose that uh, charge in a surface, you know how awesome my drawing is, um, what I see is that the electric field actually passes through that surface and I have an electric field coming out of the surface um, because of the charge that's inside of there. And if I add up that electric field passing through the surface, it's going to tell me about how much charge I have there. If I look similarly at an empty box, I, I see that even though I can get field to pass into and out of the box, if I have a field there, there's not going to be any net flux coming through that box. So what we're saying with Gauss's law is that net flux from a surface tells me about enclosed charge. That's what we're after. Net flux tells me about enclosed charge. At its basics, that's what Gauss's law is about. But at this point, you're probably a little confused about what flux itself is. So let's talk about flux. Chances are this is the first thing that came to your mind, and I had to do it. If you don't understand what this is, you just you need to watch more TV and movies. That being said, this is heavy, so we should move on. All right, flux, in general, is a field of any sort, or a vector, that's, that's, that's a better way to say it, a vector passing through an area. Um, imagine a pipe full of water that has water flowing through it. If we represent the uh, momentum of the water as vectors, the flux of the water pipe has to do with how much water is moving through that and how fast it's moving through that. We're not going to look at water flux. We're going to look at electric flux. So we're talking primarily about the electric field. Oh, how we love the electric field. Same electric field that points from positive charges towards negative charges. Um, so if we have an electric field, and we have that passing through an area. Um, a good way of calculating the flux, the only way to calculate the flux is to look at how much of that field goes through that area. Um, and it, it's important that we note that this e dot d a thing, e dot a thing, okay, um, when we talk about flux this way, um, that's the dot product. So we're concerned with how my area vector and my electric field vector are related to one another. If I were to take um, an electric field directed this way, and my area is flat like this, and the electric field went across it, um, it wouldn't have any flux. If, however, I begin to rotate that area, and make it more perpendicular to where this passes through it perpendicularly, I would have a maximum amount of flux. So, so really, 
uh, a non-vector way to write this is the magnitude of my area times the magnitude of my electric field times the cosine of the angle separating those two things. Okay, AE cosine theta. Um, that tells me how much of that field is passing through the area. Uh, a better way to look at this, I think, is if we imagined if we imagine the electric field coming up out of the page at you. Um, that's what the dots represent, the electric field coming out of the page towards you. If we have an area that is like this, then I have field passing through that area. Okay, and the angle between the area, this would be a side view, that's my area, that's my field. All right, my field is perpendicular to my area, but uh, the way we measure areas, and, and you get more of this in, in your calculus classes, is, is that the area vector, the line representing that area vector, is perpendicular to the plane of the area. So we see that the area vector in blue here, in, in this case, is perpendicular to the electric field vector here in red. That would give me just E times A. That's maximum flux. If I begin to, if I begin to rotate this thing and see that my area is at an angle where my flux is still passing straight through it, All right. I see now that there is an angle between my area vector and, and my flux. Um, the most clear example I can give of, of flux changing with the angle between this is, is looking at the intensity of sunlight striking the ground as the day goes on. Right? When the sun's overhead, uh, light is hitting the ground at kind of a 90 degree angle and it's very 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 bright uh, but over here at sunset or, or, or dusk light is hitting the earth where we're at at an angle and it's not as bright I mean if we ignore shadows and get to a place where the lights just hitting us it's not as bright it's still bright but it's not as bright as everything is at high noon because that sunlight's coming in at an angle I, I see more of this happening than I do this happening. Um, I've got some better pictures that can help us look at flux. Um, especially helping the EA cosine theta thing. So, um, here's a better indication of the area vector and the electric field vector. The more and more that this slab is tilted down and down and down and down, the less intense the flux is because there's the less field passing through it. Um, now, again, the same, the same idea. If that slab were to lay this way, the electric field would pass over it and not through it. The flux in this situation would be equal to zero because the field's not passing through my area and I have no flux. This is a simple case. We don't always have simple shapes in the world. Imagine we have some weird uh, cloud-shaped thing. If that's the case, the electric field interacts differently with every different piece of area. So I can't look at the area total like I did over here. If I wanted to get an idea of the flux through the surface, I'd have to look at the electric field going through each individual tiny, infinitesimally small piece of area. And so I'd have E dotted with a differential area. That can get complicated. We're only going to use simple cases because of how complicated that integral can get. But that's another way of looking at it. We look at how the electric field passes through a tiny piece of area. And in fact, this is the representation that we're going to use for flux more. Um, the basic idea is we have maximum flux maximum flux when the field is perpendicular to an area and we have zero flux when they are parallel
And it's and it's because we get more flux when we're passing through that area. Now, Gauss's law says the flux through a closed surface, e dot dA over a closed surface, that's what this little circle means on my integral. So this square, this cube here, is a closed surface. It's completely enclosed. A sphere would be a closed surface. The flux through a closed surface is equal to the enclosed charge divided by some fundamental constant. 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12th so that's what that constant is it just it just it just helps me out with that um, we're not gonna have to use this number very much most of the problems that we're going to do are uh, conceptual but occasionally you'll have you have to know this the AP people give it to you on on the test so what this means is the net flux, the total flux through a closed surface, is equal to the charge closed times epsilon naught. So let's look at this example. Um, here I have an electric field that's directed uh, to come in perpendicularly and hit this cube and pass through it. So if I want the net flux, what I have to do is look at the flux through each one of the six surfaces. And the sixth one stays down here. We'll say this side's one, the back side is two, uh, this side is three, bottom is four, five is the closest surface to you, uh, and six is the top. So the surface through one, okay, when going into the box and it's at 90 degrees. So I have E times A, but we're going into the box and not out of it. We'll say into is a negative flux. Looking at surface 2 on the back side, they're parallel. So I have zero flux. Looking at surface 3, that's my electric field coming out of the box through this area. That's going to be positive electric field times the area of the box. Uh, surface 4 being the bottom, it's parallel, that's zero. Surface 5 is the surface closest to me. Again, that's parallel to that area, so it's zero. Surface 6 is the top. It's parallel to that surface. So um, my net flux there, the net flux over the closed surface is positive EA plus 0 plus negative EA. And that adds up to 0. Well, and that makes sense. If you see an electric field like this and you just stick a box in it, it's obvious that there is 0 charge inside. However, if you see a box like this and you see electric field coming out of all the surfaces, we're not going to calculate it, but we can think of it, there would be a charge in there. This one would be a positive charge because they have positive flux. Overall, the charge is coming out of this box. That's going to give me a positive enclosed charge. And again, that's just a constant getting everything right. So if these arrows were pointed inside, I would have an overall negative flux which would mean I'd have a negative charge in there, which is what we'd expect. We'd expect those arrows to be pointing in towards negative charge. So what we're going to do with Gauss's law is look for situations where it's easy and convenient. And there are three things that make Gauss's law really easy and really convenient. The first one is a sphere. If I have a spherical object, and you'll have to use my, my drawing of a sphere, but if I have a spherical object that's charged, right, the electric field comes off of that sphere radially. Um, in a very uniform way. And so what I'm going to do is draw a, an imaginary, we call it a Gaussian surface around it. And that blue thing is what I represent when I'm talking about my flux, it's the electric field through the dA. That blue thing is the area, the closed area that we're talking about there. Okay. Now, the reason that we're going to use this particular symmetry is because at every single point here, looking at our situation, the electric field is constant. So that can come out of my integration. And at every single point, the electric field is, is perpendicular to my area. It's passing straight through that area. So really what we have is just the electric field times the integral 
of the area of that sphere that we built around it. I don't have to worry about cosines or anything else. This is a, a comfortable thing to use. Because it's a sphere then, Gauss's law is just whatever the electric field is times 4 pi r squared. I should have used a little r, but it's just the surface area of that fake thing that I created. That's what my flux is equal to. And using Gauss's law, we set that equal to the, in charge clo the enclosed charge over a constant. If I know the radius at the point that I'm talking about, and if I know my enclosed charge, then I can find the electric field at any point that I want to. That's one nice thing that we can use Gauss's law for. That's what tomorrow's video is going to be about. The other nice surface that we can use uh, is a very, very, very long line of charge. Very, very long takes care of side constraints, but what we're going to do is build around this a cylinder, a Gaussian cylinder. It's fake. It's not there, but what it's going to do is tell me about the electric field at this point right here. Because the electric field from this thing points out radially in all directions. And looking at it, at, and, and then it points parallel to this. So for this closed surface, the flux comes through this thing. And it's at 90 degrees to it, and the electric field is constant at all points because we're the same distance away from my charge. So looking at E dot dA, again the electric field is constant and now I just have the surface area, well dA, so it's the area of my cylinder that the electric field is passing through. Well, The area of a cylinder, if you remember, is, I'm sorry, so that's E times the area of the cylinder, 2 pi times the radius of the cylinder times the made up length of the cylinder. And that's going to be the in charge, the enclosed charge over that fundamental constant. This is how we're going to use Gauss's law to get the electric field for us. It makes it very, very, very easy to deal with that. So tomorrow we'll talk about a sphere and a line and then one other distribution um, to help us find the electric field. But this is what we're going to do with flux to help us find the electric field. That's what Gauss's law is going to help us out with. Get ready. I actually think it's a lot of fun.